Okay, I think we're all ready to get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pamela Malloy. I am the editor of the New Quarterly and director of the Wild Writers Literary Festival. Welcome to this year's festival, our ninth. This year's festival is unique because we are hosting you online from Waterloo throughout the month of November. Although we miss our in-person gathering, we're happy to be able to welcome viewers from across the country to our festival. Please visit our website for a list of the workshops, conversations, mentorships, and meditations. Before I move on to the event, I just wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors and donors who came on board or stayed with us as we moved to this new format. I'd also like to express an especially big thank you to Emily Bednars, our festival manager, for her tireless work in getting us together, to get, getting us to the point of having an online version, and also to the rest of the tech team who have made it all come together. And now on to the event. Our festival begins this year with Making Room for Disability, Mining Folk Tales and Fairy Tales with Amanda LaDuke and Emily Urquhart. Emily Urquhart is an award-winning writer who has a doctorate in folklore from Memorial University in Newfoundland and teaches creative writing, creative nonfiction at Wilfrid Laurier University. I have the great privilege of working with Emily who is a nonfiction editor for the New Quarterly. Emily's first book, Beyond the Pale, Folklore, Family, and the Mystery of Our Hidden Genes, was a Maclean's bestseller, a finalist for the BC National Award for Canadian Nonfiction, and a 2015 Globe and Mail Best Book. If you have not had a chance to read her latest book, The Age of Creativity, Art, Memory, My Father and Me, I urge you to run out and buy it. This is a fascinating exploration of creativity and aging and she'll be discussing it at another Wild Writers event this coming Sunday at 1 p.m. And now I will turn things over to Emily Urquhart, who will introduce Amanda LaDuke, our feature writer tonight, and begin the conversation. Enjoy. Thank you, Pamela, for that introduction. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here. And in particular, I'm so pleased to be in conversation with Amanda LaDuke. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> um, I just want to introduce you to Amanda. Um, she is a disabled writer and author of the nonfiction book Disfigured on Fairy Tales, Disability and Making Space, which is the book we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, she's also the author of the novel The Miracles of Ordinary Men and her new novel, The Centaur's Wife, is forthcoming in the spring of 2021, so right around the corner. Um, she lives in Hamilton, Ontario with, and these are her words, <laughs> a very lovable, very destructive dog. And she's also uh, the communications and development coordinator for the Festival of Literary Diversity, uh, otherwise known as the FOLD. Um, finally, I just wanna say, I first met Amanda when she gave a reading at the Balderdash reading series um, at Laurier. Uh, and I loved the reading so much. And I think Amanda, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was an excerpt from your Yes. Okay. <laughs> it was so beautiful that I had to approach her afterward and introduce myself. And I have been a fan of Amanda and her work ever since. I particularly loved Disfigured. I'm going to show it's this is like it's dog eared. It's it's out of control. I really loved this book. Um, it's it's a cultural critique from a disabled perspective. And um, so the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and, and about the world around us, sort of starting with the uh, European folk tales and uh, their various forms that they take uh, right up to um, their newest incarnations in uh, Disney and superheroes. There's, it's about so much more than that. And it also incorporates Amanda's um, own story uh, woven in. And uh, yeah, without further ado, welcome, Amanda. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. Let me return the sentiment and just say that it's such a pleasure and such an honor to be speaking 
you because I'm such, I admire your work so much and think you are also a great writer. Um, and I just, I'm really excited to have our conversation today and talk about the various ways that fairy tales and folk tales um, intertwine and, and how they shape our view of the world. So thank you very much for having oh, me. Thank you. Well, so I wondered if you could start us off with a reading. I really love the way the book begins. Basically, you're going to take us into the woods <laughs> and, and uh, sort of uh, tell us where, where the idea for the book happened. Um, and uh, if you would wouldn't mind reading that passage, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, as Emily said, um, this is my book, Disfigured on Fairy Tales, Disability and Making Space. You may be able to see that this one actually has some modifications from the very destructive dog. Um, <laughs> I, it may go on eBay at some point in the future. Um, and it, uh, so the book starts with me um, just talking about kind of what brought the idea for this all into place. So I'm just gonna start right from the very beginning. Rather appropriately, the idea for this book came to me while I was in the forest. In the summer of 2018, I had the extraordinary good fortune to participate in a three week writing retreat at Hedgebrook Farm on Whidbey Island off the coast of Seattle. I was working on a novel and after a particularly challenging day, took myself out to the woods to try and find some solace. There was a walking stick at the front door of my cottage and I took it without thinking then set off toward the back of the property. Somewhere at the far north end of the farm was a blackberry bush and I was eager to reach it and fill my hands with berries. As I walked, I thought idly about how much easier going it was with the walking stick, an inanimate companion to help me along through all of the forest dips and swells and hollows. It was helpful even on the paved ground closer to my residence. With the walking stick in my hand, I felt sure of myself and confident. It balanced my weight as I shifted from foot to foot in a way that was thrillingly surprising. Does this mean I should use a cane in regular life? I wondered as I made my way to the blackberries. Would it be helpful? How would that change the way I move through the world? I don't use a cane in my day to day. I have mild cerebral palsy and spastic hemiplegia and though I walk with a visible limp, my balance has been good enough for my first three and a half decades to allow me to walk unaided. But I do stare at the ground when I walk, a fact I was completely unaware of until a chiropodist pointed it out to me at an appointment when I was 27. It took a few more years for me to realize that I stare at the ground because the ground is full of danger, unpredictable and capricious, with gaps between concrete blocks, uneven bricks, cracks in the sidewalk. If I do not pay attention to where my feet are all of the time, it's pretty much guaranteed that I will fall at some point in my walking. A cane, I thought, would probably be helpful. For many of us with physical disabilities, the forest is often a dangerous place to be. There's no hope of taking a wheelchair into the trees unless there's a clearly marked and flattened path. It can be difficult to navigate a forest even with a guide dog at your side. I'd wager that the forest presents trouble perhaps even for those whose disabilities are often deemed invisible. It can be a dark place filled with all manner of smells and sensory onslaughts, a place where even the able-bodied can lose themselves on a regular basis. A princess in a wheelchair would have trouble finding those blackberries, I thought, as I crept through the bushes. And then I stopped briefly and smiled. A princess in a wheelchair? Who ever heard of such a thing? But by the time I reached the blackberry bush, that unknown princess in her wheelchair was all I could think about. That princess, and then the seven dwarfs who helped Snow White, and Rumpelstiltskin, another dwarf, and the ugliness of the beast in Beauty and the Beast, the evil queen in Snow White who transforms herself into a hunchbacked old woman, the prince who goes blind after the witch casts Rapunzel and her prince from a tower, and the princess who falls into a long enchanted sleep the witch with the crutch and Hansel and Gretel, the stepsisters who get their eyes plucked out by doves in Ashenputtel, the Brothers Grimm version of Cinderella, and all of the ugly princes and princesses who gain the throne by their cunning and then are made or revealed to be beautiful after all. And suddenly I was no longer alone in that forest. Suddenly I was thinking about these connections, disability and fairy tales, how obvious, how had I not considered these things before? And I'll stop there. 
Thank you, Amanda. That was beautiful. Um, I, I wanted you to read that opening because there, well, there's so much I like about it. And one being that it, you know, in a book about folklore, it, it feels like a very folkloric opening. You're sort of at the beginning of a, of a quest. And <laughs> the other is, uh, you might know this, but um, a lot of the fairy stories in Newfoundland involve fairy picking. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that actually, or maybe it was on some, some, some conscious maybe, level. But... Maybe, yeah, because there's, you know, that's like a, a harvest um, for Newfoundlanders. Berries are quite abundant. And so there was a lot of berry picking and often people, that's when they would get taken by the fairies. So they'd have a fairy encounter or some kind of magical encounter. And so I thought that was really oh, interesting <laughs> that you were berry picking. And that's when you are kind of, um, I mean, it felt very magical. It was like a revelation, it seemed to me. <laughs> It did. Yeah, it definitely did feel um, it felt special at the time. Like I was I was sort of, you know, mired in another project, which turned out to be the centaur's wife, which is coming out in February. So I I had this idea and I thought initially that it would just be an essay because the, the connection seems so obvious that, you know, disability and fairy tales that I was like, oh, well, clearly I'm late to the game. And you know, this has been written about a lot before by people who are much smarter than I am. But maybe, you know, I can go and I can write an essay about my own personal experience with disability and sort of weave these other things in. And so I left the retreat eventually and went home and uh, started doing some research for the essay. And there wasn't actually a lot. Uh, there's definitely work done in academia. One of the books that I consulted uh, was Death, Deformity, and Disease in the Brothers Grimm Fairy Tales by Anne Schmiesing. And she's a disabled US writer and academic and her book was wonderful, but it was an academic tome. So I was looking um, more in the realm of popular culture, looking at you know what had been written about that connection between disability and fairy tales. And there really wasn't a lot. So the essay just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then uh, finally I was like, oh, I think, I think this could be a book. Um, so I went to Coach House and, and pitched them on the idea for the book and they said, yes, thank goodness. Um, and then, you know, now here we are a year and a half, two years later. Um, I mean, it's putting a book out into the world is a very magical process anyway, I feel in, in many ways. Um, but, you know, there was something that definitely felt magical for lack of a better word about, about this one for sure from, yeah, you know, yeah start in the forest to even to now you know getting to talk about it yeah absolutely well I felt definitely that way as a reader and I was curious to know how so you were sort of on this precipice of thinking okay well how has never people how have they not thought about this before um and and you started doing your research I was wondering if like what you did first did you do the research first or did you do the personal writing first so initially when I pitched it to coach house um I had envisioned that the book was actually going to be much more in the vein of cultural criticism. So I had this whole plan. I mean, you know, the writers among us will laugh about that, right? Because how often some of us do write outlines and then stick to them. Um, and I had written this outline and what my initial plan was to look at different fairy tales in different parts of the world and look at how they um, view disability in particular. Um, but almost right from the very beginning of writing the book, the, the personal story started coming in. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it became clear quite early on that the personal memoir side of it really was important and, and needed to be a kind of cornerstone of the story. Um, because, you know, so much of how I view myself as a disabled writer and as a disabled person is inextricably linked to the fairy tale narratives that I imbibed as a young girl, right? And the hopes and dreams and expectations that I had for myself when I was young as a result of, you know, fairy tales and Disney movies and, and all those kinds of things. And it wasn't really until I really got deep into writing the book that I, I started to recognize how much all of that had shaped me. So it really made sense to bring the personal story into the book because I, I just felt like it, I had wanted it to be, you know, to have more substance, to be more academic and something that I felt people would take seriously because I worried that they wouldn't take the memoir part of it seriously. But as it turned out, you know, that that was what actually gives the book a lot of its weight, I think, is, is that, you know, yeah. you 
I'm talking about these kinds of abstract ideas and abstract fairy tales, but then grounding them in my own personal experience. Um, lucky for me, <laughs> it all turned out okay. <laughs> Well, I, I did feel like your the personal narrative, I think it's interwoven beautifully and it, it always makes sense and it is grounding. And I, I do, sometimes I think that we put too much weight on more academic or mm -hmm. something to do with statistics and less and value the memoir less as something important and serious when it's very important and serious. And it also, you did a lot of, I, I'm assuming, actually, I shouldn't assume, I should just ask uh, if, if you did a lot of, research into your personal I mean you must have had to talk to your parents and you had some of your doctors at notes which I wondered if, if your parents kept those or did you have to go back and find them or well I had to go back and find them actually and I, I mean looking back on it now I was quite lucky um, because because I had the series of surgeries that I talk about in the book the first uh, surgery happened when I was four almost five and the second one happened about a year later when I was five heading into six. And um, the surgeries were at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, the first one, and the second one happened at a hospital here in Hamilton. But because they were, um, they happened to me when I was a child, the Hospital for Sick Children still had the notes. Um, whereas, you know, surgeries and other things that I have um, experienced in, in intervening years as an adult, hospitals don't necessarily always keep them like they keep them for a certain amount of time and then mm. um, let them go so it was actually I was surprised um, to see that they still had them and, and quite thankful because you know speaking to my parents about it was really valuable in learning their experience of, of what it meant to be a parent of a child who was going through this but I was really interested when I got the doctor's notes in seeing how the medical view of the world really influence the narrative and the kind of quest, if you will, that the doctor went on in terms of trying to cure me and, and sort of looking at this problem, which in my case was a cyst in the center of my brain, which was affecting the way that my right foot um, turned in and, and uh, you know, affecting the way that I walked. Uh, and, you know, that was another instance, I think, of where, you know, I, I had originally just asked for the doctor's notes because I was looking for that kind of grounding, that kind of, you know, seriousness. Um, and I was just going to use it as, as something to, to refer back to. And I do do that in the book, but it also wove itself in in a very particular kind of way that I hadn't really anticipated. So, you know, I had all these ideas for the book when I started and, and some of them came true and, and many of them sort of, you know, got bent and twisted and, and became other things entirely, which is the best part about writing, I think. Absolutely. It's all part of the, the discovery. And so that's really interesting because I was going to ask you about um, that sort of medical narrative and how you drew mm -hmm. a parallel between the medical uh, disability narrative and that of folktale. And, and so it, was that something, maybe you could talk a bit about that, but mm -hmm. and also I'm just curious, did, did that come about after reading your own doctor's notes or? Yes. Um, one of the things that really struck me about the doctor's notes uh, was is there's this part in the notes where the doctor's talking about the fact that my right side is quite a bit weaker. And then he says, for whatever reason, she has become left handed. Right. And it was really, really interesting to me because I don't think he meant anything bad by it. But there's this sort of implicit acknowledgement in that phrasing that, you know, left handedness is unusual or is not the norm. Um, I mean, we know that left-handers, you know, don't happen as often as, as right-handers, but it was really interesting to me that there was that sort of subtle link between my condition. He was painting this link between my condition and being left-handed. And then also, you know, uh, just he had a very clear idea in his head of what it meant to be a lefty in the world and that was coming through in his phrasing. And the more I read through his notes and looked at it, the more I could see that, I mean, and you know, there's, there's good reason for this. He was a doctor, he had been trained to be clinical and look at the body as 
something that needs to be fixed, right? That right. a body needs to occupy a very particular kind of space. And in order for that body to occupy this very particular kind of space, here are the medical interventions that we need to do in order to make this happen. Um, and with the medical model of disability, uh, what you have is essentially this idea that the disabled body way, shape or form, and it's up to the medical world to fix the disabled body, you know, through um, surgeries or through physiotherapy or through a whole bunch of other kinds of medical advancements. And that stands in contrast to the social model of disability, which um, started to come to the forefront in the 1960s and 70s, and talks more about how disability essentially people come in all shapes and sizes and with varying levels of abilities and what disables people isn't necessarily their body but a, the wider society that doesn't take these different bodies into account right and doesn't accommodate them um, I also talk in the book about this thing called complex embodiment which is sort of a, a mixture a mishmash of both the medical model and the social model uh, and I think that's for myself that's more where I, I sit um, complex embodiment essentially says that, you know, society has a responsibility, we all have a responsibility to make room for the disabled body to accommodate the disabled body in much the same way as we accommodate the various many needs of the populace, but also that, you know, no amount of social intervention is necessarily going to uh, get rid of my chronic pain, for example. Right. So there are some elements of disability that you know, will persist regardless of social interventions. Um, and as with anything, these are very, very complex, complicated narratives, right? Um, there's lots of nuance in the discussion about the medical model versus the social model. And that was what I was trying to get at in the book. And, you know, coming back to that fairy tale metaphor, right? And the, the sort of the vines that go up around Sleeping Beauty's castle, like it's all very, it's all very tangled and woven together and very, very intricate in ways that I, I think traditional narratives about disability have really tried to simplify disability in ways that I think have, have really done it a disservice over the course of, of you know, our, our time as human beings. And I'm really hopeful that that is starting to change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder, where did you first encounter, or, or where, where do we all first encounter the notion that the disabled story is, is uh, well, um, like the antithesis to a happy ending? Mm. Um, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, you know, as a, as a child that grew up on fairy tales and Disney movies, I, I think those kinds of stories that we show kids when they're young have a real impact in shaping how children see the world and there's you know when when you see narratives where for example um in the little mermaid right um ariel is essentially disabled as a mermaid because she doesn't have legs she can't walk the way or move the way that she wants to move as a human and you know that even though i didn't realize that that was what was going on in my head at the time I really internalized that in a very particular kind of way and the other thing that happens I think in in when you look at disability and and um disability representation is there's not a lot of it especially not a lot of it for young kids now this is changing for the better um but there were no you know there were very few if at all, um, disabled characters or visibly disabled characters in uh, television shows, in books that I read when I was a, a young child. And, and that's by and large still the case. Um, so I think part of it is, you know, young children need to be exposed to disability and so-called difference and, you know, made to understand, be made to understand that, there's nothing wrong with someone who looks different or moves differently from the way that you move, right? That it says nothing about them as a person, as a, you know, a kind of moral judgment. And going back to the sort of simplicity of, of fairy tales, I think one of the reasons why we often have in these stories associated disability with um, 
villainry and, and less than savory characters is because it's, it's an attempt to place a very simplistic view of the world um, onto situations that can be very complicated, right? Um, when you know that the world outside of your door has all kinds of dangers and all kinds of things that you, you know, should avoid, that your young children should avoid, um, it becomes very easy to tell them simple stories where, you know, bad people look like this and people look like this um, because that then shows, you know, look out for these signs, right? Like if someone has a face that doesn't look like other people's faces, there's a reason for why that is. And a lot of this is tied into spiritual um, in the Western world. You know, a lot of it's tied into that idea of your inner, uh, your inner workings, your inner goodness is supposed to shine forth in your face, right? In your countenance. So people who are beautiful and good and pious look beautiful and good and pious. The story of Beauty and the Beast is essentially about someone who's made to be ugly because his insides are ugly. And it's only until he learns how to rectify his behavior and become a good person that his outside is once again changed to be beautiful right to match his inner his inner workings his inner strength and this these are the kinds of things that you know we we when you say it out loud you're like oh well that's a huge simplification obviously the world doesn't work that way obviously the world is really complicated but we continue to tell these stories right where no one wants to tell the story or have a story that ends with you know, a princess in a wheelchair rolling down the aisle to marry her prince or the story of Beauty and the Beast where the beast remains a beast at the end of it and Beauty marries him anyway. There's a, a certain sense of those narratives being unfinished because we have been taught to see disability as something to be avoided at all costs. And, you know, we avoid that through magic or we avoid it through medical intervention. And it's really something that's so deeply woven into our culture that, that you really need to sort of stop and think about it in order to really determine how much of that thought has, has been shaped by these kinds of prejudices and, and assumptions that we have about different ways of moving through the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, you wrote about childhood uh, bullying that you experienced mm -hmm. and um, uh, related to your disability and, and also some of the people you interviewed spoke of those kinds of stories as well. Um, I, in my own life, I work as a parent liaison for um, a North American organization on albinism, which is the genetic condition that my daughter has. And uh, it's a it's a lack of pigment in the hair, skin, and eyes. So it is a it is a visible difference, and also um, you generally have low vision. So the parents that I speak with, my job is to if a new parent contacts the organization, um, I have my region is Toronto to Newfoundland, and uh, they will put them in touch with me, and we'll just chat about you know, I can offer guidance, nothing, no medical, obviously, <laughs> suggestions or but, but any kind of guidance that I, I can offer as a fellow parent. And these are people with infants, most of the time that I'm speaking with. And every time they ask about bullying, and it's really heartbreaking, because I think, well, you know, you've got this three month old child, and you know, because they look different, that they're most likely going to be bullied and I wish I could say the opposite but then even one of the statistics in your book the changing face organization mm -hmm. the, some the, uh, survey where it was um, these are it's a charity for people with facial differences is that right yeah they okay so they did a, a survey and found that 50 percent of people with um, some kind of physical difference were bullied yeah. Uh, because of it. And so it's hard. I don't want to, of course, tell these parents like, oh, yeah, no, that'll happen because that's not fair because <laughs> that's not true necessarily. But at the same time, um, it does happen. And and I think in your book, when you write about those like the Disney stories, we watch the stories where there is no room for disability and where it is not seen as a success story. Um, I I, I think that really children are internalizing that. And I wondered if you could talk about like what 
it, what kind of a role you you think these stories might play in in creating a situation for bullying yeah i mean it's again it's it's so complicated i mean you look at some you look at a character like scar for example right um in the lion king who is the sort of younger um smaller brother to Mufasa who has a scar that sort of slashes right across his face and you know the understanding as a child when you're watching it is oh scar is different like he's he's darker than his brother he lives you know in a different place he hangs out with different animals he's an outcast mm -hmm. and part of the reason that he's an outcast and you recognize this sort of instinctively as a child is because he he looks different um the same goes in uh um, um the little mermaid for characters like ursula the sea witch or you know jafar in aladdin um facilier in the princess and the frog one of the things that i wasn't able to talk to in the book because i just didn't have room was you know how these kinds of characters are also especially in disney films often coded as queer and again, there's that idea, right, that that they act differently, um, they look differently from how we suppose that, you know, a, a person is supposed to look, right? Like Ursula is very voluptuous and big and has short hair compared to all of the mermaids who have long hair and purple skin and like all of these things that, you know, tell a young child these very sort of sophisticated visual cues that say one of these things is not like the other mm -hmm. and it's very obvious who is is not right and what that teaches a child is you know well this is just what happens when someone looks different this is you know they're they're an outcast there's no um and you're right because kids do get bullied when they are different, when they move differently, when they look differently. It's sort of a foregone conclusion that that will happen. Um, but the way that we view that has to change, you know, um, when you look at someone who has a facial difference and, you know, the, the sort of assumption is like, oh, that, that poor person, you know, they must get bullied so much. You just, you assume that they're made fun of because of the way that they look. And you, you don't sort of say, or stop to think like, why do we live in a world that is built that way? Why are we not arguing against that? You know, why are we not telling stories that celebrate difference and include difference in ways um, that are really, really important for young children in particular to see? Um, because what happens when you have these kinds of narratives when you're a young child, um, when you're exposed to them at a young age, is you just kind of assume um, and you grow to assume that disability or any kind of difference isn't a part of the real world. It's something that's different, something that's other, something that doesn't affect me, it affects them. It's not something I have to worry about. And then that, even though it's just a narrative, it's just a story, translates into very real world consequences for um, the assumptions that we have about people's quality of life, about what they can do, about what they can contribute to society. Um, you know, and, and I say that with air quotes because so much of the world's ableism and discrimination against disabled people is built around the assumptions of, of you know, your worth as a human being is inextricably tied to what you can produce and what you can do for the world. Um, and all of that ties back to how we are presented with the disabled body when we're kids and how, you know, we are bullied if we walk differently or look differently or you know how we are as children if we bully someone who looks different right no one wants to be that different person because you assume that that is a, a negative thing it's a, a bad place to be and i think what we really need to be doing is telling children and teaching our children that we all come in all different shapes and sizes and and that is okay like we, we need to celebrate everybody for who they are and I, I think that's changing somewhat in society but we still got a long way to go as you know right um, from your interviews with with those parents and it's heartbreaking you know it, it it really is for all of the strides that are being made and all of the progress that's happening um I think for me, it, it comes back to the stories. I mean, 
I'm a storyteller, so obviously for me it comes back to the stories, but I, I think they really, we really often don't give stories um, credit for shaping worldviews in the way that they do. And I would really like to see that change in the coming years and, you know, to get to a point where you could have an interview with a parent and, and be like, you know what, that used to happen in the past, but it, it's really not so much of a thing now. Um, that wouldn't that be wonderful? Like, wouldn't that? That be, would be lovely. That would be great. <laughs> well, I, you know, I do feel like books like yours, like, like these kinds of stories that are are out there now, um, are are working to to educate and make a difference. And I, and actually, along that vein, I was wondering what um, what the reaction has been to your book. I mean, I feel like I feel like you there's got to be people who have come to this book with, with no experience with disability, who, who walk away feeling changed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's been really, really um, lovely and, and invigorating thing to have. I mean, it's always nice as a writer when you put something out into the world and, and you see that it reaches people, right? Um, communication is what we do. And, and mm -hmm. when you do find someone who resonates or your story resonates with them, it's always such a lovely experience. And I think Disfigured has occupied that sort of um, lovely liminal space of being in between an academic text and then in between or in between an academic text and a memoir. And because it talks about disability, but it also talks about fairy tales, which, you know, um, people from the disability community know all of the things that I talk about in the book with regard to the disability community, but it's been a very much of, of a, an educational tool for some people who come to it from the fairy tale angle who maybe haven't known about um, disability as much. And that's been really gratifying to um, be a part of that, to, to show and, you know, to hear people say like, oh my gosh, yeah, I, I never thought about fairy tales that way before and I'll never think of them the same way again. And, and I love it when people say that because, you know, I, I don't see fairy tales the same way anymore. And my brother um, read Disfigured a couple of months ago and then he was watching, oh, he was watching, I don't know if there's any Star Trek The Next Generation fans in the audience, but there's an episode of uh, TNG where the character Worf um, injures his spine and, and you know, is, is looking essentially at a future where he's paralyzed. And at the end of the episode, spoiler alert, um, he undergoes a surgery that almost kills him, but does save him and does, you know, restore his mobility. And my brother <laughs> saw that episode and he was like, I finished it. And then I thought of you and I thought of your book. And I was like, yes, look, he's got his legs back. And why couldn't he be worth in a wheelchair and on the enterprise? And it was, it was really great because, you know, people have not, I think, um, traditionally thought about how we always go to that, right? We always reach for that happy ending narrative where disability is is made to go away. Um, and for a lot of us in the disability community, the disability is never going to go away. So our lives are built from creating these new stories and, and imagining new ways to be. And I'm just, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, um, I'm gratified that the book has been able to, to speak to that for many people and hopeful that it will continue to speak to people in, in the way that uh, it needs to be. It's certainly the kind of book that I would really have benefited from reading myself when I was a teenager. Like it, it would have totally changed my worldview, I think, um, much sooner. You know, I spent the large bulk of my life trying to turn away from and, and um, pretend that my disability wasn't there. It wasn't until I hit my 30s that it really became this sort of thing where I had to turn around and face it and, and work with all of what being disabled in this society means. And if I had read a book like Disfigured um, when I was younger and seen more representation of the disabled body in, in you know, the, the stories I was reading and the, the television shows I was watching, I think I would have come to the work of disability rights a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's lovely that your your brother was so changed by it. <laughs> I mean, that's a serious sign of success there. I'm sure <laughs> our sibling can say like, "You changed my worldview." <laughs> uh, one of one of the, um, the also along this sort of positive uh, line of 
of discussion is is um, social media uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, where you wrote about how it's become a great platform for um, disability rights advocate and um, and for learning and community building and I find for myself um, just following people who you know identify as disabled or or sometimes hashtags um like things disabled people know or whatever just as a, a passive viewer i feel like it's like eavesdropping on sort of a groundbreaking conversation i always learn so much and i wondered if you could talk a little bit about how this sort of new form of storytelling essentially is is actually been i i don't know if it's all positive but <laughs> but has been a positive for people with disabilities mm -hmm. Um, well, for me, uh, I sort of came to disability activism probably around four to five years ago. Um, and the first real, uh, I mean, I'll, Dorothy Ellen Palmer is a, a Canadian writer um, and disability activist, and she was instrumental um, in, in, you know, shaping my own path and sort of uh, showing me how one can be a disability activist in the world. Um, but Twitter, which is like my second home, <laughs> was, was um, very much instrumental in, in helping to shape that for me as well. Um, because I, I did what you just talked about, you know, where you do this sort of passive kind of lurking. And really for the first year when I was sort of understanding that I was interested in, you know, my own disability and how that shaped my life and looking at it from the wider view of disability rights. For the first year or so of that, I just followed disabled people on Twitter and I just paid attention to the conversations that people were having. Um, the hashtag suck at ableism, which is all <laughs> how, um, you know, the ban on plastic straws has real consequences, real negative consequences for the disability community for a wide variety of reasons. Um, things disabled people know, which is a hashtag started by Imani Barberin. Right. People are hot, which is started by Andrew Gerza. And that was really interesting because these were hashtags where people of all varying different kinds of disabilities could talk about their own experience, right? My experience as someone with mild cerebral palsy is very different from the experience of someone who has severe cerebral palsy, um, you know, different from the experience of someone who is autistic or someone who is uh, deaf or hard of hearing. And learning, looking at all of this on Twitter really, really showed me um, you know, how many different conversations were going on and, and how many different movements were all combined together in this one great big wonderful movement and the thing about social media that has been so lovely for so many people in the disability community is it, it gives you know a, a window into um, a window of opportunity into that kind of activism that might not otherwise be available um, particularly to, to people who you know might, might be their mobility might be impaired or you know they might not be able to leave their houses for long stretches of time and social media has really offered an opportunity for people to connect and have that kind of community that they wouldn't have otherwise and it's an incredibly powerful tool it has its detractions absolutely um and you know there are definitely some negative things uh about the use of social media with these particular things but I, I think that's not specific to the disability community i think that's just you know a oh, feature yeah. of social media in general. Yes. <laughs> yeah yeah it's really interesting and amanda i would like to continue to be the one to only ask you questions the rest of the night but i'm gonna have to share you with the audience <laughs> and take some questions we have something some seven questions here from um our lovely audience and sorry, I'm just keeping my little bar around there. Okay, um, I'm going to read you the first one. As a teacher, I would love to hear your recommendations on texts that would be effective to use to teach these issues of representation in a classroom. Think young adult. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hope it's not gauche of me to plug my own book <laughs> in that. Um, I mean, I, I think, all. <laughs> just figure, you know, it is quite accessible. So I think it is yeah. appropriate for a young adult audience. Um, so disfigured. Um, 
Another series of books, these are uh, YA fiction, um, but they're by a US writer named Katie Gardner and it's called the Brave Enough series. And it's about um, disabled teens, um, you know, going through various ad adventures and Katie herself is a disabled author. Um, some other books to check out and other writers to follow. Um, there, there's an, a US writer by the name of Lily Lanoff. She has written a YA novel called All for One, which is a gender bent retelling of The Three Musketeers, which is coming out in 2022. I know that's far away. Um, but again, Lily is on Twitter. Um, the writer Andrew Gerza on Twitter. Um, Andrew is a, also a, a sex advocate um, for disability and disability rights and does a lot of writing. Um, so maybe not uh, for the young adult audience there for um, Andrew, but um, Andrew uh, Imani Barbarin is a US activist as well. And then Dorothy Palmer, Adam Pottle is a deaf Canadian writer um, who has written a wonderful memoir called Voice uh, which is about his journey with deafness, which I would definitely recommend. Um, Dorothy Ellen Palmer has written a disability memoir as well. Dorothy's book is maybe a little bit, um, a little bit older, um, but I think also, you know, in sections raises some really interesting points about the political side of disability activism and representation and what the real world consequences of you know, the, the ableist world that we live in, how that plays out in disabled people's lives. Um, when in doubt, you know, uh, just Google disabled Canadian writers, disabled American writers. Um, there's are lots more books being published now, own voices, own voices specifically. So books that are written by disabled authors. I, I do always try and recommend books by disabled authors first and foremost, because there's lots of books that are written about disability by authors who maybe aren't disabled themselves. Um, and although I, I do think the representation is important, I think I, I, I really do try to recommend and uplift disabled voices as much as possible. That's great. I took notes as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, another question here, interesting, um, actually something you did address in the book, but we didn't get to talk about. Uh, how did mental and physical disability differ from each other in fairy tales or retellings? Mm -hmm. So physical disability operates in fairy tales as a kind of uh, a very clear marker of someone's behavior, right? We've talked about Beauty and the Beast already. Um, we talk about, you know, or I, in the book, I talk about the um, witch in Hansel and Gretel, one of the versions of that tale, she comes to them on a crutch, uh, coming to the door of her cottage, and the crutch is a deception um, to lure them into thinking that she's harmless, right? So the use of disability is, is used to evil ends. Um, and I forgot the question. <laughs> what? Oh, it's, um, what, what would you, oh, nope, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the difference between um, oh, mental physical illness. and mental, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mental illness is a, a little bit, um, it's, it's shaped differently and it's also really interesting because I think with mental illness what happens often with fairy tales is there's this kind of retroactive look where people look back on fairy tales and say, oh well, you know, obviously, like obviously the, um, you know, evil queen in Snow White was a narcissist and stuff like that. Um, when I was doing research for the book, uh, when I typed in fairy tales and mental illness, the first sort of four or five hits that I came up with were, you know, all of these Disney princesses or 15 Disney princesses who actually had mental health disorders, right? And that was someone who had grown up on Disney movies who was looking back on those films from a mental health lens and saying, oh, these characters obviously, you know, have mental illness X, Y, and Z. Um, I think Fairy tales are really interesting because they operate as ways of situating difference in the world in ways that um, cultures of the time, you know, were best able to understand. When you have a society where the medical knowledge is perhaps not entirely advanced, specifically not advanced in, you know, um, the, the peasantry and the, the lower classes who maybe were not literate and, and things like that and are just sort of telling and retelling these stories among themselves. Um, 
it's it's very difficult for people to encapsulate difference, right? To understand where difference come from comes from. So they subscribe they ascribe it to magic, um, and mental illness. You know, the idea of the changeling um, in Irish fairy culture, in particular. Um, is tied very closely to the idea of mental illness. Things like postpartum depression um, were seen as, again, you know, the idea that the fairies left a changeling child because you, as the the mother, weren't bonding with your child. Um, again, it's all these these kinds of stories that we tell in order to try and understand the world that's going on around us. Um, as to the stories that we're telling now, you know, mental illness. Um, Speaking from the perspective of someone who has depression, um, you know, it's difficult to look at the stories that we tell about mental illness and, and the way that that ostracizes people in very particular kind of insidious ways. Um, and we, we really need to, again, have more representation of that, have more conversations about that. Um, and kind of this goes back to the, the own voices angle a little bit. Um, it's really important to have disabled creators involved in all of these kinds of representation projects, whether they are disabled actors who are, you know, acting the part of a particular disabled character, whether they're disabled directors or consultants or, 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 or right? Um, we really are past the time when we are having an able-bodied audience uh, tell disabled stories. We really need to have the community involved in everything that has to do with the community. Nothing about us without us is a slogan that you know the disability rights framework and movement has used for a really long time to say specifically that. Um, any stories that we tell, any movements that we do, any decisions that are made about disabled people and disabled bodies need to involve disabled people. End of story. Absolutely, I agree. Um, I'm just looking at a, another question here. Um, this person, uh, her name is Carolyn Whitney Brown, has asked, physical disability and mental illness, just sort of adding on to the last question here, um, but it seems intellectual disability is rarely mentioned. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that so? So, um, so there is, I think, a, a, particularly from a non-disabled point of view, I think there's, there's this hierarchy that's not talked about um, as much as it should be, where, you know, people sort of and it's again tied to how much you can produce and how much you are worth as a result of what you can produce, right? So people who have physical disabilities, um, but you know, can do certain things, or you know, someone might be a wheelchair user, but they're fine so long as they have a ramp and all these kinds of workplace accommodations, they can produce and be a productive quote unquote member of society. Um, people with mental illness, the same, you know, as long as the appropriate supports are in place. People with intellectual disabilities often operate um, in, you know, a, a different space because people um, put a different value on those lives in particular. And that translates into very particular monetary, um, monetary outlooks, you know, uh, in the States, it is legal in many states to pay uh, intellectually disabled people as little as uh, $1. I think in some places it's even less. Imani Barberin actually had a thread about this on Twitter a little while ago where I forget what state it was, but it's legal to pay um, someone with intellectual disabilities 23 cents per hour. Um, and the understanding, the reasoning behind that is that um, the assumption is, is that the disabled person doesn't actually want the money. They just want, you know, the appearance of a job and the appearance of, of contributing to society. And that is so infantilizing and condescending and terrible. Um, it's just, it's just terrible in, in so many ways. Um, and we really need to look at or not even look at just to understand as a standard that every life 
no matter how it is shaped, whether a person has physical disabilities or you know, um, mental illness or intellectual disabilities, all of these lives have inherent value um, that has nothing to do with what we produce or put out into the world, right? If we start from that place of everybody has value and because everybody has value, we all have a responsibility to build a society that cares for everyone. Um, that I think is, is one of the ultimate goals of disability rights in these kinds of conversations is to really get us to a point where we, we live in a society that recognizes these things, which, you know, and this has knock on effects outside of the disability community as well. Like, wouldn't it be great if we all lived in a society where we understood that everyone has an inherent worth and, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you don't have to produce or work 80 hour weeks in order to be seen as a valuable human being. I think that would be really great. That would be wonderful. I agree. <laughs> That's really interesting that that whole idea of, um, yeah, your worth being tied to your productivity mm -hmm. and how really backwards that is and quite disturbing. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have time for one more question. Um, if this is from, um, an anonymous attendee. <laughs> uh, it's long, but I think it sort of will, it's a good final question to end on. Uh, a lot of evocative writing is showing rather than telling. We can write stories highlighting main characters with disabilities, but they will never get the audience that Disney can attract. Aside from Disney getting a hold of your book and thinking on it profoundly for a future movie, what are our best vehicles to get out your message in daily life? So I think um, this is a great question because it essentially centers around how to be a good ally, right? Um, whether you're non-disabled or disabled, how do you spread this message? And the way that you do that is, is you seek out disabled activists and creators and uplift those voices. You um, read books by disabled authors. Uh, one of the things that you know I, I really try and, and remind everyone um, especially in publishing, this is a particular problem, right? The understanding is that disabled narratives and disabled stories are only for the disabled community. Right. In yes. actual fact, disabled stories and disabled narratives are for everybody. Um, but the, the being a good ally is about making space for those voices and those um, narratives that haven't been heard. Um, and sometimes that means, you know, being quiet and, and just sort of stepping aside and, and letting other people speak. Um, I think there is a lot of, of good work being done, um, particularly in the realm of, of uh, television and narrative. There are a lot of disabled creators who are participating in and getting shows out, getting books out. Um, and really it's just seeking those voices out, I think, and, and amplifying them and listening to what they have to say, um, going directly to the source, because it's really important, you know, if someone is saying like, they do disabled people do on this um the straw ban on on social media right they have said the straw ban is harmful to disabled people for a whole bunch of reasons some of them you know plastic straws don't disintegrate when you're drinking hot liquids which some disabled people have to drink hot liquids through a straw for example um and listening to that very specific kind of of reasoning for why um disabled people are are you know uh captivated by a particular issue and then you know taking that at face value and, and saying okay this is how this is affecting your life um, I will try to you know spread that message to other people as well sorry I feel like I'm, I'm rambling but I, I do really think that listening to the community in as many ways as possible is a really important first move um, in being an ally uh, and then yeah, just uplifting as many voices and as many narratives as possible and being, you know, open to the fact that we all make mistakes. Um, I mean, I, you know, have made plenty of mistakes in my journey with disability activism and, and you know, trying to tell stories in really thoughtful ways. And when I make mistakes, the only thing that I can do is just say, you know what, I'm really sorry, I will try not to do it again. And I have learned from this experience and it's been really valuable and has really made me grow as a person. And I think 
especially with our internet culture being as public as it is, it can be difficult for people um, to make those kinds of mistakes and put themselves in situations where they might make mistakes or be uncomfortable. Um, but I, it, it's part of this necessary work, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really valuable advice. And um, uh, that oh, I think we're, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Amanda. This was so enlightening. And it, I really, I could continue to ask you questions all night. <laughs> I'm gonna send some follow-up emails. <laughs> yeah, Thank absolutely. you so much. <laughs> Um, and for anyone um, listening, I am on Twitter, <laughs> which you might have guessed from, <laughs> but you know, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or anything that wasn't talked about here. I'm always happy to, to chat for sure. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amanda. I think that after tonight, you have expanded your great allies considerably. I think oh, this has been a really rich and beautiful uh, conversation just which you know your book is really a beautiful book and I, I, I really encourage people to go out and, and to purchase it um, thank you thank you both for a wonderful conversation thank you Emily for a great question this has been a fantastic conversation um, I I'm, in closing, I just want to remind our viewers that Emily and, and Amanda's books are available uh, to purchase online from Wordsworth Books in Waterloo. Um, if you're not in the Waterloo region, then I encourage you to purchase it at your local independent uh, shop. shop. Um, the link can I to the online ordering is in the Q&A window of your screen. Um, also a reminder that, that this, like most of our events at the festival, have been brought to you free of charge. And if you feel compelled to donate in support of the festival, we'll provide a link for that as well. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation tonight as much as I did. Don't forget that the next Walt Writers Literary event is on Holding Attention with Jack Wang on Wednesday, November 4th from 7 to 8 p.m. And I hope to see you then. Thank you again, both Emily and Amanda for a wonderful session. And thank you all for attending tonight's event. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.